All right, so I watched an episode of Millennial recently on Odyssey, and uh, if you haven't done so, you should make an Odyssey account and go check it out. There's a lot of exclusive content there you won't find on YouTube, which is kind of a graveyard for interesting content now. But as uh, the topic came up of how nationalism or a radical right movement could get into power and make real change, and the host suggested, well, you know, maybe instead of uh, appealing to the people, we should go to the elites because change is ultimately top down. Um, bottom up change is kind of a myth. And so if we want to have any success, we have to go to the elites and win them over. And elites, not just in terms of, uh, you know, someone who's quite wealthy and sympathetic or, you know, maybe a renegade conservative politician or a journalist that's sympathetic or something, but going to the super elite, going to the billionaires. And I want to deal with this a bit. Because, I mean, the thing about this is I see this said more and more, you know, I saw in my uh, live chat the last day people were saying, well, uh, kind of red pilling people or winning people over is useless because, again, change is top down and uh, the Bolsheviks didn't win because they had majority support, they won because uh, they had the backing of Wall Street. And that's true to an extent, but at the same time, before uh, the Bolsheviks could get support from Wall Street, they had to uh, already be on the precipice of power. They had to have a vanguard established. They had to have a certain popular appeal, which uh, they did have by the promise of you know bread and freedom and so on. Um, and you know the idea that there's a dichotomy here between uh, getting support from powerful people and having popular appeal, I think, is a false dichotomy because you say, well, we should appeal to the elites. Well, what are you ultimately offering the elites? Um, you know, because what follows that is, well, how are you going to appeal to them? And that's where things get very vague and people say build institutions or something. But ultimately, um, there is a certain power in having popular support and any amount of people you convert is going to be more influence, uh, more resources, more money, which ultimately is liquid power in modernity, more innovation, uh, more ideas, more everything that you need, really. And it's going to, uh, any amount of people you bring over is ultimately going to take you closer to whatever your goal is, even if it is attracting elite support. You know, what are the elites? Uh, these hypothetical elites are going to be more interested in. They're going to be interested in a guy with an Odyssey channel who complains about uh, things going on and critiques liberalism or a movement that has, you know, thousands of supporters and uh, resources and independent infrastructure and is influencing the conversation somewhat. At least in the latter case, they're bringing something, they're offering something that can be used as some kind of a weapon for this hypothetical elite. So the idea that there's a, a dichotomy here, I think, is a false dichotomy. And the idea that you recognize that change is top down, therefore it's useless. It doesn't matter whether you have five supporters or five million supporters. Well, of course it does. Uh, and of course, you know, they will do things to scupper popular movements if they're against it. But you know, the people or popular support is still ultimately uh, a tool in the arsenal. It's still a factor that comes into play. The elites still have to manage popular opinion uh, in a certain way. You know, they can't just come out and say that we have this technocratic dictatorship now and democracy is a sham and uh, we're not going to follow the will of the people and so on. So I do think there's a false dichotomy here. But even aside from that, I mean, it's extremely vague. I mean, let's go to the elites. Well, who are you going to go to and what are you offering exactly? Um, because I think what like another thing that doesn't get recognized here is the class interest of the elites. Uh, you know, people look at it and it's this idea that the elites are under some kind of false consciousness of liberalism and they can't see that actually... Um, the policies that they're pursuing, you know, multiculturalism and uh, social liberalism and so on are actually corrosive and they're going to be ultimately destructive and they're going to cause conflict uh, on the ground level and so on. 
I think they recognize that, or if they don't recognize that, it's because it's not really a factor because it doesn't really matter. Uh, what the reason you have to take class interest into account is, it's like yes, maybe Jeff Bezos could acknowledge that um, multicultural societies are less cohesive. Uh, there's less social trust. You know, all of the things that uh, what was that guy uh, Putnam and Bowling alone. Um, you know, the fact that people are gen uh, generally lonelier and higher rates of depression, all this kind of thing in uh, deracinated uh, multicultural societies. We can recognize that, but at the same time, you know, Amazon put out a report saying that uh, having more diversified workplaces is a good thing because it decreases the chance of unionization and it decreases uh, worker cooperation and potentially um, cooperating against the interests of the uh, managers of, of these Amazon warehouses. So, you know, you can talk about uh, kind of societal interests or a civilizational struggle, but ultimately we live in a mercantile age and the mercantile elite are the people that have uh, complete hegemonic control right now. And you're not really speaking their language. You know, they're not thinking like you in terms of uh, Western civilization and all these kind of uh, lofty ideals. They're much more focused on on profit, on their own individual power, on uh, the legacy that they're leaving. And they don't have this kind of civilizational consciousness. So when people say, well, let's go to the elite, I'm not sure what they're suggesting. Is it that we haven't shown um, the merchant class the right uh, arguments for HBD or, you know, we need to get them to read Bowling Alone or, or one of these books. I don't think it matters. They're not ultimately ideological people that will support ideologies insofar as they're beneficial. And you see that with the many forms of leftism they support. You know, uh, it's not that the CIA was a supporter of, of uh, new left ideas in the mid-20th century when they began to support those ideas and promote them in Europe through Congress of Cultural Freedom and so on. Uh, it's not that Alan Dulles was a big believer in critical race theory and third wave feminism. It's that these were useful tools in an arsenal, in an ideological uh, and political struggle against the Soviet Union. And it was a weapon that could be used to weaken the potential of a genuine left, a genuine socialism taken off in Europe that would have been sympathetic to the Soviet Union and would have ultimately therefore weakened the American Empire's uh, geopolitical interests. So I think from the get-go, there's this kind of false assumption that uh, you can kind of convince them with the right ideas. And again, this is the thing where it's like, well, the people don't matter and it doesn't matter convincing people because uh, we need to win elites. And then it's like, there's almost an unspoken assumption that uh, if you have like the best ideas or the, the best critique or the best ideology, that that's going to automatically mean that you like win in this battle of ideologies. But nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, you know, again, the Frankfurt School and New Left ideas didn't win because they were more correct or because they were offering anything so innovative. They were just useful to the mercantile class. And it's ultimately the capitalist mercantile class that controls the university system, the education system, uh, the military and so on. Uh, and so I guess the other question is, well, as well as what are you offering these people or what, why would they listen to you? Where are they actually going to come from? Who are you talking about when you say uh, the elite? Because obviously it's not, uh, you know, Davos, man. It's not uh, Bill Gates or any of these people. And I think in this conversation it was said, well, uh, a disaffected portion of these elites. Um, so then the question is, uh, who is that? And you can maybe look at mid-20th century movements and say that there was a certain level of... Uh, business support for nationalist movements but circumstances change and the thing about the situation in the west now is there isn't really a, a national capitalist elite anyway you know the likes of um, Henry Ford in the US or Fritz Thyssen in uh, Germany in the 1920s these kind of people really don't exist um, you know globalism has become so uh, pervasive and so integrated and uh, we're so deep into neoliberalism that even in Ireland I mean you have small businesses and shop owners and you have a public sector 
and you have multinational corporations and it's the, the economic growth and the taxation from the multinationals that's uh, paying for a large part of the public sector and then with uh, small business owners and so on they're obviously benefiting from that growth as well but in terms of some kind of uh, industrial capitalist elite that has their fate kind of tied to the nation state where like a strong nationalist protectionist economy would benefit them it really doesn't exist i mean the business community would ultimately lose out from say ireland leaving the european union as an example then you can look at Germany, who does have a strong manufacturing base. You know, they manufacture all these uh, automobiles and technology and industrial stuff and so on. But uh, again, you know, no one has benefited more from the European Union than Germany. And uh, it's the European Union that has been the driving force in terms of demand for that manufacturing output. Uh, same thing with the US, you know, these are heavily integrated global systems now and the power of, of some kind of national capitalist lead is kind of non-existent. You could also look at sort of old money, like old moneyed families in the UK or something, and that would be potentially a source of support, but they'd ultimately be doing it for kind of ideological reasons. You get a couple of outliers that are um, sympathetic to these beliefs, but that's not really, uh, you know, a major lead faction in the way that was uh, discussed in this matter. Um, so, you know, I mean, there was, again, you can look at times when maybe conservative or radical right or nationalist movements were supported by elites. But again, um, there have been structural changes. You know, people will use this to try and discredit uh, nationalist movements that, well, there was a time when the mercantile class supported nationalism. And that's true because it was it was a battering ram against uh, the more stultifying forms of of monarchy and uh, religious Europe that had certain um, prohibitions on, on usury and things that were a limitation uh, to uh, capital growth and the interest of the mercantile elite. But they're, they're, you know, they're done with that tool. Now they have the global marketplace. It's the same thing with uh, colonialism. You know, this is like uh, Spencer does the same thing. He says, well, you know, populism is useless. Let's appeal to the elites. But then what he's offering is just kind of a, a form of mercantile rule that they've outgrown, which is sort of um, paleoliberal uh, or paleoprogressive um, colonialism uh, or imperialism. But the thing is, again, they have no need of this form. I mean, they didn't ultimately end colonialism because they suddenly uh, got bleeding hearts for the natives or whatever. I mean, there was a certain moral element to it and there were there was the growth of, of anti-colonial movements that obviously played a role and added cost to this. But ultimately, the reason is that we moved to global capitalism and there isn't really need to have uh, an army uh, keeping watch in Hong Kong and uh, uh, to have your, your military uh, overseeing like the trading of manufacturing goods between Hong Kong and Britain. Now this is all done on stock exchanges and you can uh, press a button, you can tap the space bar on your keyboard and you can transfer millions of dollars and you can transfer the ownership of uh, tens of millions of dollars of resources. And that older form of, of uh, colonialism is just not needed anymore. So a lot of these things is like, you know, let's try and, you know, surely the elite, surely the mercantile class will be interested in this sort of uh, older form that they used, but ultimately they abandoned that because it served out its usefulness. And now that they have uh, neoliberalism, if you want to call it that, global capitalism, globalization, they really don't have need of a lot of these older forms like nationalism. They have no need of social conservatism, you know, we individually might say that well social conservatism uh, lack of social conservatism is causing this kind of social rot there's an excess of libertinism and you know people's morals are declining and it's making people less happy and the birth rate has fallen all these kinds of things but again if you're a, an international uh, capitalist if you're a member of of the davos class of uh, the mercantile elite this isn't really a concern, you know, it's not really a concern if uh, the birth rate in Germany is in decline. It's not really a concern 
if people are living um, more sort of liberated or de degenerate lifestyles, um, you know, they're still ultimately uh, contributing uh, to the capitalist system and gradually, you know, with the, the growth of AI, they're becoming less and less necessary for it anyway. Uh, you know, same thing with the birth rates. Yes, birth rates in the Europe and really across the first world, you know, in Asia as well, are below replacement and declining. And there doesn't seem to be any way to reverse that. But again, is this a huge concern if you're a mercantile elite? You know, I've read plenty of economics papers about uh, immigration into Europe. And they look at this in a very sort of materialist way in terms of uh, looking at what can be measured, looking at things mathematically. And there's a very simple solution, which is you have a decline in birth rate, but you have another part of the world, you have Africa, where you have a high birth rate. Uh, you have a young uh, population. Um, you have a population that hasn't really been exposed to liberalism. They're still uh, capable of working any of these jobs and you can just import them uh, in place of um, having a high birth rate. And then when you have that solution, you don't need to pay maternity leave you don't need to give all these kinds of benefits. You don't need to pay a, a wage that a family can live on, all of these things. So again, if you're looking at material interest, um, you know, what is it that you're actually offering the elite? Let's go to the elite and uh, try and get them to, to support us. Well, what are you offering them? You're ultimately offering them this kind of um, moral, ideological critique of uh, the system that they've created to benefit themselves materially and I don't think that's really going to cut it that's uh, you know if it was just the case that this was how things were decided you really wouldn't be able to explain any of the history of capitalism it's always been uh, downstream from what's uh, beneficial to the material interests of the capitalist class and that's not to take a completely Marxist uh, materialist view of history this wasn't true for all times, but when you have a mercantile elite, then a lot of these things do become true, that uh, economics does win out, that uh, they're interested in um, materialism over, over any kind of ideology, that economic forces do start to determine the direction of things, and ideology, popular ideology, hegemonic ideology, becomes downstream um, from material relations, and money does start to decide things. These are all kind of uh, elements or factors of mercantile rule. Um, but again, you know, you're going to the elites, let's go to the elites again, what do you have to offer them? Um, you can look at, you know, there's been mentions of, of people like Peter Thiel, uh, who's an American venture capitalist supporting right-wing movements in the US. But, yeah, you know, it's kind of an interesting test case because even if there is someone that does want to support something like this, what is there there to support? I don't think that they actually get a great return on their money. Um, again, you're going to have a disparate group of people that are sort of passively engaging in uh, critiques of society from the right. You have maybe a couple of publishing houses, uh, you have podcasts, websites, um, a kind of social network. But in terms of what you're really offering someone like that, um, I don't see a whole lot there. And that again takes you back to the original point, which is that there isn't a false dichotomy because then if you want to have something to offer them, then you have to go and set about building institutions. And to build institutions, you need people involved. Uh, you need people to volunteer. You ultimately need to uh, be able to pay them. And, uh, you know, this is, again, where a kind of false dichotomy comes in, where it's like, let's uh, appeal to the elites versus, like, no, everything has to be completely bottom-up, and uh, no one should even, like, be taking money out of this movement or something. But there's a middle ground where, yes, ultimately you realise that change is top-down, but you have to start somewhere, and you have to start if you want to uh, have that kind of um, top-down influence with building institutions, with um, creating a power base, with being capable of exerting influence. And that comes from uh, having more supporters, having high agency people involved, having resources flowing in, having um, money so that people can be paid to do full-time work, this kind of thing. So again, I think we're back to uh, a kind of false dichotomy. And the other thing is, you know, one potential area you could see as well, you could look at another 
thing that can happen that can cause a revolutionary change is uh, geopolitical shocks. Um, you know, the Second World War p played a huge role in uh, Mao and the CCP coming to power. And the Bolsheviks probably wouldn't have come to power without the, the First World War, actually. I think there's no doubt about that. So often you have a quite stable situation and then a geopolitical shock comes along and it can really shake things up because maybe you only have the mercantile elite in charge and they're making all the decisions. But suddenly there's an outside threat or your country's been invaded and, and now perhaps the military elite steps up and says, well, uh, you know, capitalism is great and all, but uh, ultimately if the nation doesn't survive or, you know, if we're, if we're conquered by a foreign power, uh, none of this matters. So security has to take precedence. So you could conceive of, well, perhaps uh, there would be a disaffected military lead, or perhaps the capitalists in the West would see the rise of China and of a multipolar world as a threat, and then therefore they would see that uh, leftism, progressivism is not a force capable of taking on a foe like China, and so they would say that we need to beef up our military, we need to have a more functional population, we don't want uh, our best people like dying of opiate deaths and obese and so on. And so perhaps then they would embrace some kind of national conservatism. I think you're seeing this to a degree. I think that's probably part of the motivation of someone like Peter Thiel. You know, you have these national conservatism conferences, these people like Euro Mazzoni and so on. But this is the other thing is, even if they decide that, okay, well, um, this extreme form of progressivism is becoming uh, a threat to the existence of these states that we ultimately have a certain dependence on. You know, we don't want, uh, you know, it's a lot harder for these people to do business under the Chinese Communist Party that sets in place all kinds of uh, controls and makes sure that uh, what's being done isn't sort of against the national interest and so on. It's a lot harder to do business under those conditions than it is in the US where uh, to, there is no national interest except whatever the uh, whatever the super rich decide it is. So perhaps you could have the elite would say, yeah, this is going too far. We need to be able to um, deal with a, a more multipolar world. We need some kind of national conservatism. But again, you see with someone like Thiel, he's not going to go to the radicals that are on Odyssey and BitChute and Telegram and are... Um, are talking about Julius Evelyn and these people, they're, they're going to ultimately, uh, if they have need of something like that, they're going to create their own um, more milquetoast, more uh, kind of merchant-friendly version of that, which is what I think you see with national conservatism, where it's like, uh, it's some elements of that, but stripped of the real radicalism, stripped of the real uh, traditionalism, it's stripped of uh, any discussion about, you know, a certain question, all these kinds of things. Uh, and so ultimately, if they need you, they'll just create a carbon copy of you and get rid of the parts of your ideology they don't like and make it friendly to themselves. Um, I don't think that's hugely difficult to do because, again, what does, a, you know, does a radical right movement right now have something that can't just be created in a couple of weeks' time with uh, your Amazoni and whoever else, uh, these sort of conservative, uh, like Catholic integralist type people, Rodri or whatever. Um, you know, there's no kind of institutions there that they need to circumvent or whatever. So it's very easy to, for them to just create their own version of it and have that version made up of people that are totally reliant on capital support from these elites, from these patrons. Whereas, you know, if they support the kind of people that are on millennial, well, they're for the most part, genuine radicals, and they don't have that same level of security in their investment that they'll have if they create a kind of fake, more acceptable uh, version of it that's more amenable to liberalism. So even then, even if there was a situation where uh, they needed that, um, there's no reason why it would be you. And as far as the military elite goes, well, perhaps, uh, you know, some people were I was having this debate before the election that, well, if, if, if Trump loses, you know, leftism is just going too far and the military elite can't allow this. Ultimately, there's a, a military elite in the US, there's the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they must see how bad things are getting. You know, they, the capitalists have been in charge and have been pushing radical leftism and progressivism because that's beneficial to them. But there's another interest there, which is the military elite, and eventually it can go too far where what the... Uh, 
capitalist leader promoting starts to hurt national security interests and then the military elite may step in and the Pentagon may come along and um, fund some kind of riotous movement, which may actually be what's happening with someone like Peter Thiel. But <laughs> if you're looking at the sort of uh, warrior class or you're looking at the military industrial complex as where uh, revolutionary change would come from, well, the problem with that is the mercantile class has been scared of this happening for decades. And since Obama, you know, they've been purging generals, they've been purging people from the ranks of the US military that could potentially be uh, sympathetic to something like this. You know, all of the articles that come out and books coming out now talking about the potential of uh, civil conflict and all the focus on right-wing militias and the media that's created um, and, you know, the purges of, of people from the military that, you know, are they're found on on Discord or something expressing a conservative opinion, this kind of thing. You have that guy, uh, is it Mark Miley, who is head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's talking about white rage and that he wants his soldiers to read critical race theory. In many ways, these ideologies are as much to ensure the submission of that potential warrior class uh, as they are to influence the general population. And if you look at who is deciding the direction of the military, who's deciding the direction of the US empire uh, on a military level, well, all the people in those important positions are chosen by the CFR. And you can watch my video on the CFR. Uh, whether it's, you know, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, all these kinds of positions. Uh, the CFR is full of former generals, is full of future and former politicians that will handle these questions. And the CFR is ultimately the seat of the deep state. They make these decisions and the CFR represents Wall Street. It has all of these uh, investment banks on the board. Um, it was always intended to serve the interests of Wall Street. You know, it was run by David Rockefeller for decades. And uh, that's what's deciding uh, the direction of the military industrial complex in US foreign policy through their publications, through their influence. So it's completely uh, subservient to the mercantile elite. Again, you know, the military elite is completely subservient to the mercantile elite. And in Europe, well, I mean, there isn't even really a military elite to speak of. I mean, what kind of army does Germany have? You know, is there really a potential for some kind of military elite there that would be hugely powerful? I don't think so. You know, Europe is ultimately uh, made up of vassal states to the US empire. Uh, so that kind of huge systematic change would have to come from the US, the heart of the US. And as I say, they devote all of their energy to ensuring that there's no kind of warrior class uprising. Again, you go back to the CIA and the CIA was promoting new leftism in Europe. It was promoting um, the Frankfurt School. It was promoting third wave feminism. You know, we know now that many of these people, many of these famous uh, 20th century feminist philosophers were literally on the payroll of um, the CIA. And uh, you know, again, there the CIA was uh, always intended to serve the interests of money power. Uh, the first head of the CIA was Alan Dulles. He was a corporate lawyer uh, that worked on Wall Street for years and his brother who became uh, Secretary of State. And he would meet with Wall Street executives and they would plan coups in Iran, in Guatemala. You know, coup in Guatemala was done on behalf of a banana company because they didn't like the leftist government there. Uh, the coup in Iran against Mossadegh, a populist leader, was done uh, after a meeting with several oil companies that had interests in Iran. So you have to understand every wing of the military industrial complex. Uh, there is no division between the interests of the mercantile elite that are pushing leftism and uh, the military elite. Um, so that would be one potential thing would be some huge geopolitical change. You see that coming in terms of um, creating some kind of split within the elite. The other thing would be some kind of huge economic change, and that's often how other revolutions have come about. Um, again, you can look at uh, China, even Iran. Oftentimes it's the case where there's a, a leader in power, a dictator, and they're not really 
capable of keeping in tune with the direction of economics. There's technological and economic innovation that is creating a new paradigm and has the potential to bring a new elite into power and make a lot of people tremendously wealthy. But because you have this old, um, not innovative dictator in charge, he is kind of holding that up. And then what can happen is that you get this new potential elite uh, that wants this paradigm shift, that wants this uh, move towards modernization, and they can bring about uh, a revolution. But again, we don't have that here because we don't have old stuffy dictators in charge. We have people like uh, the World Economic Forum that are planning things on the basis of these kinds of uh, revolutionary economic changes. And so while they're empowered, they're not going to be the ones that are going to be holding up, uh, you know, the next revolution in robotics or AI or uh, what's probably going to come in the next 20 or 30 years, a big revolution in uh, the medical industry and medical technology that's going to create huge innovation and uh, growth and um, uh, profits and so on. Uh, so, you know, again, you get to this problem where when you have the mercantile elite in charge, they're kind of managing all this quite well from a certain perspective. Uh, even if, you know, you can look at things, uh, you can look at violent crime or something, or you can look at any metric uh, that you feel is, uh, that makes it feel like you're in a civilizational collapse. I mean, for the elites, you know, they're making more money than ever. They made billions over the course of the past couple of years due to the economic changes that they forced through. Um, you know, they've never had, there's never been more consumer choice. It's never been easier to uh, hop on a plane and fly from New York to Paris and Paris to Dubai. And it's never been cheaper to do that. And, you know, electronic goods have never been less expensive, all these kinds of things. Um, the medical industry is advancing. We're going to have advances in AI. We're going to have cures for a lot of um, debilitating diseases in the next few years. So there's a lot of metrics by which things are getting a lot better that from a certain sort of myopic uh, standpoint, you can't see. But again, you have to remember that these people think in terms of economics, they think in terms of growth, of innovation, of consumer choice, and in all the kind of metrics that they see the world through, uh, things are undoubtedly getting better. And I don't see the kind of revolutionary economic change that would uh, be shocked at and would push them out of power or would create this potential new elite that uh, could be put in power by revolutionary economic changes, but is held up by uh, an existing kind of out-of-touch elite. Um, because again, any of these revolutionary economic changes, they're being done in tandem with the state, they're being done in tandem with the politicians. Um, you know, the state will provide uh, investment in the kind of things they need, whether it's uh, green energy or robotics and so on. And there's a harmonious relationship there. The reason it's harmonious is because capital, big capital controls the state. So if you're talking about um, some kind of economic shock that could do this, it would have to be something kind of more anarchistic, I think, which would be some kind of unforeseen um, huge uh, collapse, whether it's from a resource shortage or um, you could imagine something like hypothetically, you could imagine that something like cryptocurrency has this revolutionary effect where a lot of the rules of central banking, like lending money and so on, uh, become kind of surplus to requirements because you can do this on the blockchain. You can access all these financial instruments on the blockchain and it's easier and it's more secure and it's cheaper, it's lower rates, all these kinds of things. Something like that would kind of shift the center of, of economic control and would allow for more organic, um, decentralized locuses of control to emerge. But it would ultimately be something like that that you'd be waiting for. It would be a massive geopolitical shift like the US um, losing this Cold War to China and a, you know, a true multipolar world horizon where the US empire has less capacity to enforce ideological uh, hegemony or again, some kind of economic shift like that where technology allows for a massive wave of, of decentralization and privacy and so on that really upsets the, the plans that they have for the economic system. But in terms of the existing uh, mercantile elite, in terms of going to them, trying to appeal to them, I think it's nice in theory and you can, you can say that, but it doesn't matter if you're correct. The ideology ultimately doesn't matter a whole lot. They're behaving according to their 
material interests and if you just look at it in that way there isn't an alignment between the interests of themselves and what is called the radical right which is a kind of anti-mercantile it's against all of the things that benefit them having fluidity having a, a lack of borders and a lack of capital controls and a lack of kind of social controls on behavior like religion and so on all these kinds of things that are barriers to capital accumulation um, when the only real elite is a capitalist class they're not going to have an incentive to support a movement that wants uh, policies that are ultimately going to be barriers uh, to that accumulation so again i think it's nice in theory but um you know until someone has a, a solid plan or someone can show me how that would be possible i think the the only thing to do is to just uh, for these movements is is to just continue um trying to convert people and trying to grow power from the bottom up and trying to expand influence and again it goes back to this uh, there is no this false dichotomy between well power comes from the top down therefore it's uh, pointless to try and get anyone over to your side no more people there's more influence more power um all of the things uh, that i said uh and so you know until a, a new paradigm arrives until there's some kind of collapse some kind of uh, huge geopolitical shift um trying to appeal to people and trying to uh, win people over is still uh, the only kind of course of action i can see for sort of fringe political movements but yeah actually before i go um subscribe uh, like the video and subscribe to my Odyssey channel because if you ever see that my YouTube is gone all of my videos are backed up there there's exclusive videos and streams as well and everyone is kind of getting on Odyssey now it's a better website in my opinion so yeah do that and take care